I would give you an overview of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which I visited yesterday, which happened to be my birthday. It was a lot of fun, and I thought that I might just go through the photos that I took and give you some explanations of what I saw. So this is the first thing that I see when I walk out of the uh, parking garage. It's the Robinson House. Now, I've never actually been inside because I'm usually so excited to get into the uh, museum, but it is some stunning architecture. I really love some of the details on it. Here's the path to the museum itself. You can see it in the distance there. It's the uh, well-designed and uh, clear path from the parking garage to the museum. There's some uh, brand new uh, installations of plants throughout the campus there. And I captured some of those. Art in its own right. This apparently is a crepe myrtle, which I was amazed by because I've never seen one so big. I'm not really sure if that's true. There's a coleus. Red coleus. I believe that this is a uh, a piece plant. A uh, not really sure because it hasn't flowered. But uh, I had one of these, and when it flowered, it was just glorious. Yeah, just some beautiful stuff on site there. This is the uh, one of the pieces that I visit all the time uh, when um, going into the museum. It's just to the left of the doors, and it is called "Untitled" by Jun Kaneko. And it reminds me a lot of Jasper Johns, those stripes. Just a beautiful piece. Here's the front view of the Robinson House. This is a little gathering space inside the main uh, lobby. And I just love these chairs. I thought they were very Kubrickian, very uh, 2001. <clears throat> And of course, there's these huge uh, murals in lots of places. Over by the Best Cafe, this is the view through the window. Over to the Daughters of the American Revolution. I'm not really sure what that building is over there. But uh, I think it may be a functional office building. I'm not really sure. There's a tiny little gallery uh, of just one piece just inside of the uh, lobby. And this was the piece that was there. And I had not noticed this face uh, previously. But this is from a series called The Man in the Wall by Alexander Brooks Jackson Jr. Just thought it was a beautiful piece. Very. Uh, urban inspired, great texture, love the palette. Uh, the Virgin, Virginia Museum has some really amazing pieces. This for example is a dolly and here's a detail of it, not detail but zooming in. And it's got uh, classic dolly elements, things that are absurd. And that's called the God of the Bay of Roses. Definitely a surreal piece. This is uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. And it's called Sand Hills Near Grinnell. And I just really love the palette of it. I thought that the palette was great. <clears throat> Reminded me of uh, Monet's Haystacks somehow. 
big, beautiful trees around campus. They take very good care of the grounds. Sculptures. This is uh, facing out the front of the museum that goes along Arthur Ashe Boulevard. And yeah, just a beautiful campus. The trees are immense there. They have a library. I'm not sure if it's restricted to members. I didn't get that suspicion. I guess if I had walked in there, I might have been able to sit down and look at some of this content. But uh, what a great resource. This is one of the things I really loved about the Philadelphia Museum as well, was their library and resources. This here is a piece. I don't actually have my desktop audio going because there's no uh, audio to this video. And it's the only video that I recorded during the trip. And it's this neon installation called uh, A Small Band. And it says, the title of this work is extracted from a quote by Daniel Hamm, imprisoned as part of the famed Harlem Six, or Blood Brothers, a group of young black men wrongly accused of murder in 1965, handling four other members of the group. Wallace Baker, William Craig, Ronald Felder, and Walter Thomas were eventually exonerated. Robert Rice, however, remains incarcerated, serving a life sentence. In a statement shared a few days following his release from police custody, Ham spoke publicly about the brutality experienced at the hands of the prison guards. Daniel Ham said, I had to, like, open the bruise up and let some of the blues, bruised blood, come out to show them. It's a massive piece. I mean, really visible from the uh, lobby that I mentioned earlier. Uh, some wood prints, uh, wood block prints. These were stunning. If you've ever seen wood block prints, uh, multicolored wood block prints uh, created, you know how much work was involved in this. Uh, they were by an artist named Itu, Ito Shinsui and this one is called Awazu from Eight Views of Oni. And there was an installation around the room. Really, really great prints. Just beautiful. Of course, they have antiquities in this museum, like many museums. <clears throat> and, uh, Stunning samples, really great stuff. This was a Greek piece, a black figure, amphora, and lid. This, of all people, is Caligula. If you've ever seen the movie, you know what he was up to. Uh, just a stunning piece to be in front of, and the way that it is presented is... Uh, beautiful, uh, certainly larger than life, even though it's life-sized. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm able to see this piece so often. They also, right behind this, have this mosaic, which I was really inspired by. I did a, a mosaic not too long ago, a couple years ago, and the work involved is uh, incredible. It's really fun to try to figure out how to represent something in tiles. So this was a section of the four mosaic depicting the four seasons. Beautifully done. Really great stuff. They have several uh, Eastern rooms. Uh, Chinese artifacts and Korean artifacts and of course very often you'll encounter Buddhist uh, statues, bodhisattvas. Here's canon. Beautiful pieces. This was Damo, the 
founder of Zen Buddhism. Atop waves. It's hard to capture the elegance or the presence of these pieces. It's it's uh, it's just a small thing. It's probably eight inches or ten inches tall, but it's just overpowering in its presence. <clears throat> This was interesting. This was a uh, sculptural rendering of a bodhisattva, and apparently it was in a fire, which is why uh, there appears to be some fire damage on the face. Speaking of damaged works, here is Euripides, a busted nose, great form. Another view from the uh, second level of the lobby as you walk in. You can see there's the uh, gift shop and stairs ascending up to the level, to the level I'm on. I actually did not get to the second level during this trip. I don't know if I've ever been to the second level <laughs> at VMFA. <clears throat> I always get stuck in the modernist section and just go kind of go crazy. There's that huge uh, blues, blood, bruise installation and the chairs that get used all day long and the library down below. First century BCE a Roman head of a herm. And then here's a piece from 1958 by Elaine de Kooning. I don't know much about Elaine de Kooning. I know, of course, a lot more about Willem. Uh, but just a great piece. I don't know if she was depicting a horse in this. It's probably mentioned. bullfights. So this was probably a rendering of a bullfight and despite its clear abstraction uh, she would often focus on actual subjects. Franz Klein I believe, yeah. An untitled piece. He's renowned for these black and white uh, compositions. This one is not the largest Franz Klein I've seen but uh, I'm happy to be able to get so close to it. Oh, Mark Rothko. Uh, Mark Rothko is, is often known for these pieces that break up the plane into two or three uh, sections. And Rothko was, uh, uh, he often thought about uh, art as a religion, which I thought was kind of interesting. And he would try to make pieces that sort of uh, not overwhelmed you, but encompassed your visible space. One of my favorites. I'm so glad that that piece is there. This is Jackson Pollock in a piece that uh, is relatively small comparative to his much larger works. And uh, of course his story is very sad. If you don't know about Jackson Pollock, uh, there's a great documentary that has, uh, I can't remember who the lead was in that, but well worth watching. This is Clifford Still, and he's related to the other abstract expressionists that we've seen here, like Franz Klein and Jackson Pollock. Just a uh, stunning, ripping presence big blocks of black and texture and torn edges. Beautiful piece. He says, the sublime, a paramount consideration in my studies and work from my earliest student days. This is more recent work, 2019, and their homes, the dreams of home unraveled by Shanique Smith has 
actual uh, fabric bandanas worked into the piece and coming out of the piece tried to capture the three-dimensional element of it. Oh, these were these large pieces. When I first saw them, I thought that they were um, a German artist who does these huge canvases, often depicting Germany after the war. But this was not that artist. Uh, but very, very similar. This is actually moss that's been worked into the canvas. Uh, Athena Latocha, 2019 Schleckig, Mississippi River Mud, and Spanish Moss on paper. Huge pieces. Well worth seeing. <laughs> One of my favorites in the museum is this piece by Robert Arneson called General Best. And he says, I want to make high art that is funny, outrageous, and also reveals the human condition, which is not always high. General Best portrays Sidney Lewis, who with his wife Frances gave VMFA their extraordinary art collection in 1985, which now comprises the majority of the works on view in the museum's mid to late 20th century galleries and beyond. Arneson's artistic style perfectly complemented Lewis's own humorous spirit, and Arneson covered the work with wit witty references to the business Lewis founded, in Richmond in 1957, best products. So uh, it's so funny. I grew up in Oxford Valley. I'm sorry, I grew up in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. And there was a mall there called the Oxford Valley Mall. And nearby the Oxford Valley Mall, there was a best store, uh, which eventually I think was best in Basco. But at any rate, the building there was covered in flowered tiles. The, the entire building was covered in flowered tiles and uh, the artist whose name escapes me, one of those tiles from that artist is in the Virginia Museum of Fine Art near the uh, near the best cafe. So it's incredibly interesting uh, that I've come so far away from that place but still have that very deep connection to this memory, set of memories that I have of visiting Best at Oxford Valley Mall. And here's Best himself. Cool stuff. And a great sculpture. Okay. As we continue through uh, modern and uh, contemporary art, you get pieces like this where I should have gotten gotten the detail, but it's essentially just uh, glazed, fired and glazed ceramic wired with bailing wire and a, on a painted steel armature. Whoops. Uh, it's hard to describe how, what an impact this piece has when you walk up to it. Red Rover. More great work. Trenton Doyle Hancock, the former and the latter, or Ascension and Ascension, <laughs> in 2012. Colorful, textural, whimsical. One of my favorite pieces in the museum. This time I'm using the artist as superhero as evidence that I don't know everything, that there is no script. Good stuff. Then there are these very tight, uh, almost design-like uh, pieces. Juju Boogie Woogie by James Little in 2012. Oil and wax on canvas. I didn't see the wax. But uh, the colors are just right. Really beautiful muted tones. And an, uh, an electric surface. Really great stuff. <laughs> they were having a private event in the uh, marble room, what they call the marble room, and they were setting up for it. And I saw it from like three different angles and uh, could not figure out how to get over to the Fabergé section, which was over by the stairs there. 
never did figure it out. I guess I could have done it if I had gone upstairs and come back down. I love this piece. It reminds me of a, a radar or something. It also reminded me of when you take uh, crayons and you put crayon in all of kinds of different colors onto a page and then you cover it with black and then scrape away the black. I'm sure that that, that was the technique that was used. Uh, it's called Necklace for Mary by Jack Whitten. And it's from 1980. It's surprising. It looks like a much more contemporary piece. I'm dealing with painting as a collage, paint as sculpture. I've changed the verb to paint. I don't paint a painting, I make a painting. So the verb's changed. And in doing that, I've broken through a lot of illusionist, illusionistic qualities. Cool stuff. <laughs> Another shot of the private event. Man, great piece. California painter uh, Richard Diebenkorn, right? Ocean Park number 22. He was uh, renowned for doing these top-down views of the, um, the landscapes of California, but instead of looking out at the horizon, looking down on the map of things. And uh, beautiful color fields, changing colors, the palettes were beautiful probably based on the reality of what he saw, wheat and grass and water. Temperamentally, I have always been a landscape painter. You tell him, Rich. Oh, and then we come into this area where these the there are these uh, hyper-realistic, photorealistic pieces. Uh, Robert Cottingham in 1973 made optic and it's it is vibrant on the canvas and uh, really electric in the way that it vibrates on that canvas just an incredible attention to detail and many other pieces in this particular gallery were like that super photo photorealistic and uh, well worth visiting. This is a piece called Sam's Hardware by Richard Estes. Richard Estes has several pieces in this gallery and um, man, I just love his work. Just so tight. Here's another one by Richard Estes called Danbury in the series Urban Landscapes. This was in 1972 as well. I hadn't even been born yet maybe my favorite piece at the museum by Richard Estes. This is Paris Street Scene. Richard says, I always like to think that the paintings look very realistic, but the subjects don't actually exist in this way. It's a selection, taking a few elements of reality, other visual elements, never mind the noise, the smell, the actual dimensions. Yeah, it's very clean, incredibly clean, uh, and yet photorealistic captures every detail. Really great stuff. <laughs> Here's another view of the uh, private event in the marble room. And all across the way, I wonder if I can see it, all across the way, that's uh, something is uh, that's part of the Fabergé collection. Couldn't get there. Don't know why. Andy Warhol, Three Elvises. Or Triple Elvis, 1963. And he says, In my artwork, hand painting would take much too long in any way. That's not the age we're living in. Mechanical means are today. Silk screen work is as honest a method as any, including hand painting. Revolutionary thing to say, but certainly has inspired many, many keepers of that axiom. Lichtenstein, Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, this is lamp two. It is not only painted, but it is a sculpture. And in keeping with his other work, where uh, he was borrowing from comics and methods for printing, as in Gullscape from 1964, right there. 
think I have a detail here, yeah. You can see those dots that make up the background, some solid yellow in the cloud, obviously the solid of the uh, gulls themselves. And you can see that the uh, dots overlap in some cases in order to create the illusion of a change in color. Beautiful work. Related, this is not Roy Lichtenstein, this is Haradina Pindell, and this was from 1972-73, and Haradina, who I assume is a female scanning. I was becoming more abstract in my figurative painting. My work just started on this trajectory where the circle became a part of my work. It's really lovely. These are uh, paper cutouts, circles, and uh, dots on a canvas. I don't necessarily see a figure here, although there very well may be. I just uh, thought the canvas was mesmerizing. Good stuff. Ooh. This is uh, Sari Deans. And this is Star Circle. What's interesting about this, when I saw it, I thought for sure that it was Jasper Johns, who is by far my favorite artist. <clears throat> and it turns out, in the story, at the time she made this work, her apartment served as a social nexus for younger artists of the day, such as John Cage, Jasper Johns, and Robert Rauschenberg, Leo Castelli, and Art Dielek, who championed many of these artists, considered Dean's unconventional use of materials, as well as her encouragement, to be an important influence on this younger generation. Whoops. Very clearly, you can see echoes of Johns in this, as well as... Uh, Rauschenberg, I mean, John Cage really had his own thing, but good stuff. And I photograph this piece every time I'm at the museum. It's three-dimensional, but of course it's uh, a bas-relief, and it's untitled number 25 in 1960 from Lee Bontecou. Who says, my concern is to build things that express our relationship to this country, to other countries, to this world, to other worlds, to glimpse some of the fear, hope, ugliness, beauty, and mystery that exist in us all. Good stuff. Sewn together. Pieces of welded steel, canvas, copper wire, etc. The long view of the gathering space on the first level of the museum. There's blues, blood, blood bruise across the way. Uh, so, 1910 Modernism, Henry Rousseau, Tropical Landscape, American Indian Struggling with Gorilla. Look at the color of that. They have Picasso in the museum. They have uh, several pieces, I counted. Uh, this is one. This is a gesture on a horse. Yeah. 1905. Uh, and this was really before his breakthrough with um, Cubism, which happened more, I think, around 1910. Uh, this is when he was working in blues and pinks and uh, referring pretty constantly to these characters such as the jester and musicians. And um, just a lovely piece. Simple. It's oil on composition board. It's surprising. It almost looks like ink on paper. Good stuff. Van Gogh present at the museum. I tried to get a, a three-quarter view to try to capture some of the impasto that Van Gogh is famous for. I don't know that I successfully did. This was Daisy's 
in Arles in 1888. Beautiful piece, maybe not as iconic as some of his others. Wow, this muted landscape is by Seurat. Uh, Houses and Garden, circa 1882. Uh, you definitely, if you're familiar with Seurat's, Seurat's work, uh, you're familiar with the way that he uh, more or less drove uh, pointillism, where uh, points of color were added and building up a canvas in order to render a scene as the eye might see it. But that piece preceded it. You may know this. This is Edgar Degas. And one of his uh, sculptures is Little Dancer, aged 14, from around 1880. It's one of 25 copies authorized by the artist's heirs after his death. The original model's glaring deviations from the classical ideals of traditional, sculptural, uh, traditional sculpture upset critics and members of the public alike when it was shown at the Impressionist Exhibition of 1881. Uh, Degas was definitely obsessed with ballet dancers and the work is iconic. People love this piece. Great stuff. This is Monet. Uh, Iris is by the pond and his water garden at Giverny was a constant inspiration to him. Uh, also, let me see, 1914-17, I'm not sure when he was going blind, but I imagine it was much later than this. Uh, some of his blind affected canvases are uh, hard to look at. It's so sad knowing the breadth of work that he did and the brilliant use of color and the subjects that he used uh, for him to end up blind is just sort of sad. Claude Monet, famous impressionist. Ah, uh, Rodin. This is St. John the Baptist. I've been lucky enough to uh, visit the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia and have really been inspired by his work. Uh, just great renderings of human form. Good stuff. Cast before 1952. Uh, probably made in the space between 78 and 80. This is a room that's set up the Warsham Rockefeller bedroom, and it is decadent. Stained glass windows, stained glass light fixtures, lacquered furniture, plush, rugs, just a beautiful space. Sorry, didn't mean to jump out there. This is George Washington. Uh, they don't know who made it. It was around 1800 to 1810, made of elephant ivory, and uh, does not resemble the guy on the dollar bill, as far as I'm concerned. But. Uh, probably a more likely resemblance. I don't really know. Good stuff. Ben Franklin. Great rendering. I don't know why that is blurring out as I'm going in and out, but I'll stop doing that. 
another unidentified artisan, probably around 1876. Hey, there's me, and looking into a mirror, trying to photograph the outside frame by John Lafarge, uh, renowned for his stained glass work in the late 1800s. This painting moved me. This was uh, Moonlight in Yosemite. Really captures the way that light falls when it's very, very bright, like a full moon. Good stuff. That is Albert Bierstadt. Here's another space in the museum where you can sit in front of the Richardson House. Richardson House. Uh, and look out on the goings on on campus. Andrew Wyeth? Yeah. So, Andrew Wyeth did these beautiful renderings of people and spaces. And uh, something about Wyeth's work is just touching. It's um, remarkable in the way that he pulls out details and makes them available to you to really know what that space or that person was like. A Norman Rockwell lives in the Virginia, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So I'm sure that this was a magazine cover at some point, but beautiful piece. Norman Rockwell produced more than 800 illustrations for several canonical American periodicals, most famously the Saturday Evening Post, and numerous corporate clients, including the Franklin Mint, which commissioned the collector as part of a group of works that could also be issued as plates. Cropped it left, the bust of Benjamin Franklin pays homage to the corporate patron, and the coins and ingots in the painting were in fact marketed by the Franklin Mint. Whoops. Let's go back to that for a second. How about that? Good stuff. This was a sculpture. When I first saw it, I thought for sure it was like Bruce Melman. Uh, but it's Michael Richards, 1999, called Winged. The use of feathers and tar, mirror and ladders, mirrors and ladders, the concept of flight as both freedom and surrender, all attempt to open a metaphorical space into which the viewer can be seduced. The space allows for an examination of the psychic conflict which results from the desire to both belong to and resist the society which denies blackness even as it affirms. Powerful stuff. I've seen this piece a couple times now. I'm fascinated by it. Uh, it inspires me to want to build something like this. There's a four-walled space with a ceiling ceiling is covered in photos, backlit photos. <clears throat> there are uh, small pieces that are set into the cubbies all throughout. And the material is just scrap material. It's just vernacular stuff that was lying around. I don't think it's been specifically distressed. I think it was probably distressed anyway. These lovely teacups on one of the Corners. You can see there's <clears throat> plywood being used and linoleum tiles right there. Glass lantern slide pavilion made from reclaimed wood, linoleum tile, carpet, fire hose, wire, metal, four ceramic teacups, 254 glass lantern slides, and an LED light. These two pieces, the one to the right and the one to the left, 
are part of a series on seasons by Michi Miko. This is the season summer. You can see the influence of things like uh, what appear to be lightning bugs. And then here is winter. Yeah, 2019. Very recent piece. I think it's beautiful. Both of those pieces. Very nice. Some more uh, wall based sculptural pieces. This is Henrique Oliveira. Uh, this is from 2013, Zillam Pasto. And it says plywood and pigment. I'm trying to figure out how this is plywood. Not really sure, but a stunning piece nonetheless. Another contemporary piece. This is from 2004, Stadia 3 by Julie Meretu. I'm interested in describing this as a system, a whole cosmos, and that is the overall painting. All the little minute detail marks act more like characters, individual stories. Each mark has agency in that sense, individual agency. So, I should have gotten some details, but there's all kinds of things going on in here. Beautiful, spacious. The lines really draw you in and around. Love that piece. Julie Meretu. <laughs> this is a pretty whimsical piece. Here's a detail. This is by Nick Cave, Untitled Sound Suit. Fabric, sequins, embroidery, mannequin. You can see one of the sequins sparking up right there. And I just could not imagine running into somebody wearing this. It would be a great uh, performance piece. Good stuff. This is a view of the Muse, a Muse restaurant and the Best Cafe, which is behind the uh, Registers there. Stuart Davis, circa 1950, little giant still life. Just powerful work. I've seen every Stuart Davis piece I've ever seen, I've been moved by the color line, point line plane. Alexander Calder, one of his famous moguls, right there, 1951. Great stuff. This installation you see as you walk into the museum, and it's covered in symbols. Ryan McGinnis's Art History is Not Linear has a uh, let me see if I can skip to it. <laughs> has a key that you can go and read what all these symbols mean and then try to interpret how they fit into this piece. Just stunning work. I really, really love this piece. I wish that you could get a little closer to it. This is from across the uh, walkway. Here's the gift shop. Nice gift shop. What you would expect, I assume. They did have the uh, the book from the show that I saw on guitars for ten bucks. The monograph was I almost picked it up. But I don't need any more books, man. Oh, and then exiting. It had started raining pretty heavily by the time I exited the museum. 
good opportunity to capture some things. Oh, and I went to go get some dinner. Here's a uh, common pair I ran into as I was walking along. Streets of Richmond are a lot of fun to walk. Uh, this place is, let me find the Jokas. Jokas. And uh, you walk through this little door. And it is a tiny little space with some really uh, ancient seating places. It reminded me a lot of um, Miller's or of. Uh, uh, the old PJs in Princeton uh, and more locally it reminded me of um, I don't know just a few of the bars that haven't updated or restaurants that haven't updated their furniture in a while and everything gets sort of a patina of legitimacy this place has legitimacy I tried the American wheat by bills while I was there and had this amazing sandwich they call this the sailor and it had spicy mustard pastrami Swiss and um, bratwurst comes with chips comes on rye comes with pickles delicious stuff very good mouthful this was the booth I was in Let's see some of the flavor of the place there were some locals there, they were having a good time. The service was great. Had fun conversations with the uh, wait staff. Oh, nice beer list there, if you care. Let's see what happened after that. I got up, took some photos. Great place. And then finally, on my way out, I captured this, what I think is an American holly, right next to the museum. And that was it. So, uh, I know this has taken a while. I wonder what my recording time is. 47 minutes. Uh, I had a blast for my birthday. It was so cool to go to the MFA and to get a great meal and to be able to see all this cool stuff, meet some new people, learn some things, become amused, learn some more things, pause and contemplate, stop and smell the flowers, all those things. Anyway, thanks so much, thanks so much for spending some time with me.